two and a half months ago, the University of Washington named a new provost. We had the opportunity to speak to Provost Kause about the challenges that come with her new office in Gerber Dang Hall. What are the responsibilities of the provost? Um, well, you know, actually I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, I'm, you know, in, if, if this were a corporate setting, which it's not, um, it would be kind of the equivalent of the COO and with, a, with uh, the CBO combined, so Chief Operating Officer and the Chief Budgetary Officer. So I'm second in command is basically what it comes down to. There's a joke about the provost, and the joke about the provost is that the provost follows the president around and says what he really meant was no. Um, and, you know, that's not what I do, but I think that where the joke comes from is that one of the things that the provost does is, you know, I'm the money person. And uh, during times like this, there's an awful lot of no that ends up getting said to some wonderful ideas and wonderful things that we'd like to do. I work with the deans, um, I work with the president, I work with the vice presidents and vice provosts to basically try and ensure that, you know, we provide a UW quality education and that, you know, students can get the classes they need and that, you know, we, we run a top, top rate institution in terms of education. Same in terms of research. Try to make sure that we have all the mechanisms um, in place, all the infrastructure to allow and facilitate the fabulous research and scholar scholarly work that our faculty that our faculty does. How have the first couple months of being provost been for you? Busy. Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, one of the positive things is I've been at the university for 26 years, um, and so things aren't coming at me that I've never heard of or that I'm not familiar with. And I'm working with people that I know. And so that part has been, you know, has, has been relaxing. I was a little afraid of, oh my God, you know, am I gonna be in and open my head? And, you know, and I feel like I, I know what I'm doing. On the other hand, uh, what's been a little disconcerting has been the sheer volume. Um, the number of things that um, I need to get done in a day, in a week, in a month, um, are just uh, are just overwhelming. I was telling someone the other day that I try and be in my office. I don't think I've ever come in later than eight. Try and get here more like seven fifteen, seven thirty, and I seldom get home before eight or nine. Um, and you know, I've been pulling weeks like that. And uh, this weekend, I'm coming in. I've got meetings pretty much all day Saturday, and I'm still going to be behind. What is your favorite part about being involved in the University of Washington community? I really love the student contact. Um, one of the things that I've really treasured is that even though, even when I was chair um, and when I was dean, I was able to keep my hand in teaching. Um, I used to teach the last three or four years I've taught in the Summer Bridge program, and that works best for me because um, I can do it during the time when the other demands are a little bit lower. Um, that program was transferred to the academic year, so I didn't teach in it this summer, and so um, I'm looking for other ways in which um, I can continue to be involved in teaching. Now, I, am continue to, I do continue to be involved with students in various different ways, including the Provost Advisory Committee. What would you say to students who are concerned about deferential tuition or just tuition in general? I understand the concern. Um, I, you know, I, I absolutely do. Um, what I would say to students is that, you know, I think, you know, you know I, I grew up in a family where there was no question um, that I was going to get a college education. Um, my dad had a college um, degree. He had a Ph.D. Um, but because of um, immigration and the revolution and so forth and so on, I grew up pretty poor. Um, you know, both my parents worked in factories, uh, and I qualified for every financial aid program um, in the world. But still, you know, I graduated. When I graduated, I had somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars worth of loans, and that was in 1977 dollars. When I was growing up, one of the things that my mom always talked about is there were there were some things where we tried to do it um, as cheaply as possible, but she was always big on good shoes. Um, uh, you know, she had bad feet, and I think that was part of it, but it was that, you know, she felt that cheap shoes were just bad value, that you were better off having fewer shoes, but, you know, your shoes should be good, comfortable shoes, which, as you can tell, I still tend to wear. And I think about education in some ways. You know, I, I think of my mom talking about value. Um, and. You know, we're not the bargain basement that we used to be. This really was um, an absolute bargain 
Um, and now we're not, we're not that, you know, we're not, I, I love being able to give students a bargain, but I still think we're incredibly good value, and it's the best investment that I think students can make. Not only does it pay off in the long run in terms of higher earnings, but I think it pays off in terms of a richer life. It's, you're investing in yourself, and I think that's the best investment you can make. So, you know, I understand the concern. I think we're working very hard to continue to make education affordable. We actually have more low-income students at the university this year than we've ever had, despite tuition being higher, um, because we've been able to put money back into financial aid. In terms of differential tuition, uh, I think that the real issue is that, um, and I think that uh, Dean Matt O'Donnell in engineering has, has put it extremely well when he says that access has two A's. Um, one A is the affordable, um, but the other A is the available. Um, what we're talking about with differential tuition, um, if we go there, and it, you know, it hasn't been decided yet, is uh, we're looking at programs that are more expensive to deliver and where there's high demand, both on the part of students. These are places that students want to get in. And there's also high demand in terms of there's jobs out there. How do we expand? How do we expand those programs? Um, since those programs are more expensive than other programs, and they're more expensive than tuition plus state support, the only way that we're going to be able to expand those programs is either by the state giving us more money, and it looks like we may get some more money for engineering from the state this year. We're still waiting to hear, but that, that's something that's being considered. But the only way we can expand is you know, through a combination of having students pay more for what they're receiving. What do you think is the most important thing that students can do to communicate with the administration and other faculty and their professors? One thing that I would say is that sometimes, and you know, I know that at times I felt this way as a professor, and I hear others that we feel like the Maytag repairman. I don't know if you remember those commercials, you know, that uh, the Maytag repairman was supposed to be the loneliest person in the world because I guess Maytag uh, uh, appliances weren't supposed to break down, and so they were lonely. Well, you know, sometimes I think we feel that way during office hours and that, you know, that, that our office hours are full the day, at, the day before or the day after an exam, um, but, you know, on a, on a weekly level, um, sometimes we don't hear from students, you know, unless it's what's going to be on the exam. And so I think that one, uh, one wonderful way of engaging with faculty is when you actually have questions that have to do with the material and, you know, you know, tell me more about this, or what should I be reading, or I found this really interesting in coming to office hours to talk about, you know, the intellectual content of class. The way that, that students connect with administrators is around policy issues. You know, whether it has to do with tuition or differential tuition, or it might have to do with fees, or, um, you know, number of credits. You know, there's, there's a number of, of issues like that that come up. Um, I work with students a lot through the PACs, and so I'm trying to figure out ways to be more accessible. Um, but, you know, invite me to stuff. I, I can't always go to everything, but, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the, they're, the Chicano students are doing a fundraising dinner and then a movie, you know, the Mecha group, and I can't make it, so um, I actually wrote them a check so that a, a student could go in my place to the dinner. But if I could have, I would have gone. Um, is there anything in general that you would like to comment on? I think this is really one of the few places in the country, and I think that there's few places like this left, that both offer very good access. Um, like I say, about a third of our students are Pell Grant eligible, 32 percent, and over 25 percent of our students are first generation. Um, and so that really shows access, um, and that we're managing to make it affordable. Um, like I say, that's the largest, that's the biggest socioeconomic diversity that we've ever had at this university. Um, and that's partly because we have, while we've been raising tuition, we've also been putting more money back into financial aid. But the other thing that we have to offer is absolute excellence. I've worked with a lot of students here that are out doing amazing things in the world, sometimes only five or ten years after graduation. Um, if you look at what our alums are doing, they're all over the place in terms of industry, in terms of government, uh, in terms of the creative arts. Uh, and, you know, we offer both of those things. I do worry 
that universities are, are no longer, that I worry about whether universities um, and public universities will continue to be, and you know, we talk about universities as, as economic engines. That's an important part of what we do for the city, the state, the country. But I think we also need to be engines of opportunity. You know, places where, um, you know, in essence, you know, people of modest means can come out and be masters of the universe. Not that many universities do that. 